Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Heavy Repping. My name is John John Davidson, and what follows is an article entitled An Introduction to Vintage Guitar Picks, written by Joe Macy, published here in part at his request, and in full by Heavy Repping. If you would like any more information on vintage picks, please visit Joe's YouTube channel at the link in the description, or visit heavyrepping.com for the complete text-based article. Part 1 Vintage Guitar Picks For over 100 years, a mind-boggling diversity of guitar picks have been commercially available to the general public, yet remain largely unknown and unseen to most guitarists and guitar collectors today. This is understandable considering most picks, branded, having a logo, or not, have a period of retail availability under 10 years, with many styles being offered for a few years or less. Obscure as they may be, there are literally thousands of different vintage picks, and those shown here were acquired starting in 1991. Obviously due to space limitations, we'll cover just a few of the subcategories, and get a glimpse of the remarkable diversity of plectrums as they've passed through decades of musical history. There are two main categories of picks, those with a logo and those without a logo. Among those with logos, they are further divided into the pre-print impress logo era occurring before 1950 and the post-print ink logo era occurring after 1950. As with most general rules covering vintage picks, there are exceptions, but only a few. They will be noted. As history would have it, there are of course no rock and roll picks from the pre-1950 impressed no ink logo period of pick production. But there are many artist picks from the preprint era who were incredibly famous in their day. The artist picks of rock and roll that band collectors acquired today started in the 1970s, and while cool for many reasons, in their own right, as a group they fail by comparison to vintage picks in terms of their shape, colour and overall visual appeal. A bold statement, yes, but self-evident in the photographs that follow. Granted, there are individual exceptions. The year 1950 also serves to divide the golden age of guitar picks from the post-golden age era. Will Hoover, author of the book Picks, describes the golden age as those picks manufactured from American-made celluloid. The last celluloid plant here in America shut down in 1949. Existing supplies could safely be assumed to have stocked the market for another year, hence the role of the year 1950 is again a point of demarcation in vintage pick history. Prior to 1980, commercial guitar picks were branded with logos that included just four main categories. Artists, guitar companies, wholesale distributors and their name brands, and the names of the guitar manufacturers who made everyone else's picks. Between 1980 and 2000, those categories expanded, and after 2000, those categories exploded to include every conceivable natural, cultural, and commercial theme imaginable. As with vintage guitars, vintage picks are also fixed in time and cannot be redone, changed, or remade, which lends to their innate authenticity. The oldest extant example of a guitar pick thus far discovered goes back to 1881, and is in fact not a guitar pick, but a mandolin pick. The Crystal Faro is the patriarch of all picks to follow thereafter. But this begs the question of how do we know the history or age of a pick? For the Crystal Faro, it is explained later on in the legend. The most common methods of authentication include patents, trademarks, musical instrument catalogues, jobbers, and cross correlation with pick guards, which are also made of the same celluloid picks are made of. Know the year a guitar with a distinct tortoise pick guard was produced, and you know the period of time in which picks made of the same celluloid also appeared. Also useful are cross correlations by distinct shape, style, and colour patterns. The memories of elders who served in the musical instrument industry have also clarified previously difficult to identify picks. The identity, Age and origin of an estimated 5% of vintage picks are relegated to methods of extrapolation subject to error, and to fix them within plus or minus 10 years would be considered a good guess. 
Fortunately, this probability of error mainly occurs with unbranded or no logo picks with characteristics that cannot be cross-correlated with other vintage picks, so their actual numbers are small. No preference has been given to any particular brand. Fender and Gibson alone could have commanded this entire article as they garner the greatest attention as well as having a remarkable range of vintage pick types, but our focus here is diversity. The category of guitar brands in general is given first highlight, but it should be noted that all the other categories have a near equal or greater range of diverse styles, with some far more attractive than anything offered by the guitar companies. Part 2. Guitar Brands The first interest in picks among non-collectors for purposes other than playing is not the obscure, but one simply bearing the name of a specific guitar brand. For that reason, they are recorded first priority here. The pieces are arranged progressively according to age from the late 1940s to the late 1970s, starting at the top left and moving down as you would read a page. While many variations in logo, shape and colour occur with most brands, duplication has been kept to a minimum in order to feature a greater variety of names. In the first two rows, distinct styles of tortoise celluloid and variants thereof are prevalent. Vibratone on Red Wheat, Framus, Custom Craft, Rickenbacker and National on Whiskey on Ice, Gibson and Bruno are printed on Coke on Ice, Fender's first pick logo, seen against Slow Gin on Ice, and Maxwell on Flaming Charcoal. These names for celluloid colour were created by vintage pick collectors in order to further define specific styles and more easily identify them. Those styles mentioned were only made from the late 1930s to the late 1950s, and are highly valued for their rarity and appearance. While all attempts are made to establish a factually based background, sometimes that information is simply not available. In the case of the Black Guild pick, its date is inferred by the print style. A Les Paul pick, not shown, catalogued from the late 1950s used the same exact gold block lettering on same black celluloid. In both cases, the gold lettering deteriorated to a dull, yellowish colour. It is common for startups, in the case of Guild 1952, to offer a pick with their logo in order to announce their arrival. No earlier styles of the Guild pick are known to exist. As for the Imperial pick, the fact it's done in a particular cursive writing suggests it is from the 1950s, however cursive picks of this style continued into the late 1960s. Other cursive styles span the 1950s to late 70s. Epiphone admirers will easily recognise the E pick, far right second row, being true to the Epiphone name as it appears on guitars. The Marathon pick is the only name featured twice, a wavy stylistic logo with an open scroll surrounding it. The logo shape is the same on both picks, but the colours change. White logo on a trapezoid tortoise shape, and red print on a small white jazz pick, giving each a noticeably different appearance. I'm hard-pressed to find a red logo featured on any other pick from the 1950s or 60s. Next to the Marathon, we have a Gretsch T-top logo on their flagship shape, the number 348. It's true that many names appear on the 348 during the vintage era. However, Gretsch is the only company to choose it as their feature shape for their company name. That honour usually goes to the most common of all shapes, the 351, though there are a few jazz shapes as exceptions. The 300 series of identifying pick shapes was created by the D'Andrea company and is used sporadically throughout the remainder of the article. Jetstar is also worthy of comment because it is printed on sparkling laminate drum shell celluloid, blue sparkle face up and red sparkle on the back. On row 4, the Lyle teardrop is a standout because of its small, unusual shape, that of the rare 368. Fender, Gibson, Martin and all the other big-name guitar makers never used that shape. Lyle had their name appear on at least a half dozen shapes. It would be remiss not to call attention to the Conrad in the same row with its eye-popping mother-of-peril celluloid with a gold streak down the middle. That streak is not printed, it is part of the material. Conrad picks were made in Japan and though unseen in the photo, bear an impressed Japan stamp. The celluloid is Italian and their guitars were sold in the USA. Also on row 4, Eco, Kent and Goya show stylistic fonts exclusive to their own brand, as is the case with many other fonts seen in the group photo. Conversely, 
Fender's first pick logo seen in row one is done in a spaghetti noodle style that a number of other pick names appear with. Compare it with Maxwell in row two. Interestingly, Fender, Gibson and Martin do not use guitar to pick logo matches in this group. Fender's second generation 1960s picks would, however, match their headstocks. By now it is apparent that many of the brand names that appear on guitar headstocks appear exactly the same way on their picks. Rows 5 through 7 are predominantly 1970s era with the possible exception of the English-made nylon red K pick in row 6. It's also only one of two non-celluloid picks in the group, the other being the Japanese-made genuine tortoise shell Sokova in row 6. Alvanez and Gurian guitars did something unusual. They printed their logo sideways. This is the same orientation a pick would appear in your hand if you stopped playing and lifted your thumb to look at it. All these picks are of interest to those seeking to match a period pick with the same era their guitar was made. I've received calls from more than one luthier restoring vintage guitars, interested in the correct era pick for their finished instruments as case candy in the accessories compartment. Part 3. Other Vintage Logos For many established pick collectors, these picks are held in no less regard than guitar brand picks as most are not guitar models. Because they are often less known than guitar brands, it further adds to the allure of collecting pieces outside the mainstream. They are arranged as before, starting with the oldest at the top left, and that honour belongs to the 1947 patented diamond-shaped Bob Clifton. It is one of the rare exceptions that slides under the 1950 pre-print rule, the celluloid is referred to as wide-banded tortoise. This celluloid type is always rare and not seen in any post-1950 tortoise celluloid styles. The jazz pick next to it is a mystery in terms of origin, but its basic block-style print and whiskey-on-ice celluloid give away the 1950s period of time in which it was produced and is seen up to the mid-1960s in an old Bruno catalogue. Out of the seven picks appearing in the top row, you'll notice six of them are not the standard 351 shape. In fact, there are seven distinct shapes in row one. All the pieces are very rare, and the alt pick has a cork grip on the back and features not one, but two distinct font styles. For decades, I had been aware of this particular shape as also having a cork grip pick, technically labelled the 347C in pick manufacturer D'Andrea's 1947 catalogue, but it took 23 years before acquiring the first one to place in the collection. To have it appear with a logo was an even bigger surprise, all the more adding to its character. I consider it the most desirable if not the rarest in the photo, but that is purely subjective as any other could be a favourite to another collector. Interestingly, the vintage logos of non-guitar makers are much more common not in numbers, but in variety. In other words, Far more picks have been produced with the Fender, Gibson and other guitar makers' names on them in terms of sheer numbers, but a far greater number of non-guitar makers' individual logos make up the bulk of the vintage pick scene. They are comprised of musical instrument wholesalers such as Measle, Coast, Penn, Pacific, Wabash, Lion Healy, HF or Harris Fendel, and Herco. Individual music stores, Pete's of Canada, Alt, Farber, McNeil's and Bronin, the white 351 with blue print FN, Fife and Nichols, of Los Angeles, was a haunt of wrecking crew studio players such as Carol Kay and jazz players Barney Kessel and Alan Royce. While Barney's work is well known and highly regarded among players, Alan worked with the Benny Goodman Orchestra as a sideman for Billy Holiday, Coleman Hawkins, Lionel Hampton and other notables. Fife and Nichols ordered picks for both players bearing their initials, the Teleno, like that of Bruno in the guitar brand's display, merit more than one category and could have been placed in either display. There are three guitar instructors, Gene Lees of Los Angeles, Pitine, Mandolin, and Mel Bay in the fifth row, Green Nylon Pick. Pickmakers D'Andrea and Dunlop of the US are easily recognised. Sharkfin of Sweden in the fourth row, and Galley of Naples, Italy, fifth row, the oldest pick company still in existence since 1890. Germany is represented in the sixth row as a Jewa, George Walther mosaic. Shoji Nakano, owner of Pick Boy, stands out with a stylized silver N on a white three-blade prop pick at the tail end of the last row. Having nothing to do with the guitar at all is Jet Tone, 
a brass horn mouthpiece maker, black triangle with gold print. And way off the focus of the music industry and unique for its time is D'Andrea's Adlib series. This group of standards shaped 351 picks featured pop slogans of the 1960s American lexicon, one of which is featured here. Tune in, turn on and drop out. Last pick in the fourth row. The expression was forever immortalised when booted counterculture Harvard psychology professor Timothy Leary spoke at a 30,000-strong rally of hippies in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park in 1967. This simply went way outside the box of anything ever printed on a pick in the past. It has the distinction of being the very first to make a social statement of any kind on a pick. Having this pick stuck between the strings at the first fret of any guitar on a stand could indeed be an eye-catcher. It would be over a decade until a few less creative popular rock and blues artists started having more offensive language, usually some variation of fuck you, printed on their personal picks. You may notice the five mosaics. Wabash, Top Notch, Golden Eagle, Cinco and Jewa are all printed on different colour blends. The term mosaic is a misnomer, as they are random blended colours and not true mosaics, but that name has stuck and is common usage for them. The 1960s was the most marketable time to produce mosaics and reflected the psychedelic tie-dye culture of the day. The mosaics declined in appeal in the late 1970s and were virtually unseen during the 1980s. They've made a comeback in the US since, but not in the diversity of styles they were previously offered in, and certainly not as attractive. Vintage guitars to which this magazine is dedicated have an allure shared by vintage picks in the eyes of their respective collectors. The 1967 red Glow Picks, first pick in the sixth row, is made of plastic strands woven in such a way as to produce the first 3D effect on a pick. Its appearance changes as it is turned. Two decades would pass until other pick companies would produce picks with a 3D effect not of fibre, but instead using advanced laser printing techniques with a metallic-based ink. Next to the Glow Picks is a D'Andrea Gold Hot Stamp imprint on creme de menthe celluloid. Very unique, with a very short period of production. Lastly, on the bottom row is a Liskova, black print with a star dotting the I on snakeskin celluloid, made in France. It's one of the earliest known snakeskin picks with a speculative date circa 1985. The company it represents is a mystery. By correlating shape patterns, the Liskova is related to the unprinted French Jura picks in the mosaics and patterns display, begging the question as to why a Slovak name would appear on a pick of French origin. Part 4. Get a grip. The only guitarist who's never dropped a pick is the one who has never used one. And so the job of creating the perfect non-slip pick has been ongoing for well over a hundred years and continues to this day. This display illustrates 14 distinct vintage grip styles going back to 1907. There are plenty more not shown here. Abbreviated details are provided with verifiable dates where possible. All others are circa estimates extrapolated by comparison to known details of other picks with similar characteristics. All are rare to extremely rare. On a 10 scale, with 1 being common and 10 extremely rare, they would rank 7 to 10. For this group, I've provided those rankings so the reader may develop a comparative sense of their rarity denoted numerically with an R in front, example R8. An R10 plus indicates only one is currently known to exist. Picks 4, 6, 8, 12, 22 and 29 currently hold that ranking. The good news is most collectors have one or more 10 pluses in their collection so they are entirely within grasp and every year vintage picks that have never been seen before surface. 1 and 2. Fluted vertical and horizontal grips as early as 1907. France. Jerome Thibauville Lamay. Cat R10 and R9. 3 and 4. Cup grips. German. 1926. US. Bruno and 1930. Tonk. Cats R8. Japan circa 1965. Mosaic shape 346. R10. 5. Impressed crosshatch, rubber triangle, Germany, circa 1950, R8. 6. Corrugated grip, Germany, 1910, Meinl, and Harold, 
cat number 17, R10. 7. Moulded raised cross hatch grip, green tortiline celluloid, Germany 1930, Haupt, cat 25, R8. 8. Raised parallel slat grip of completely unknown origin, circa 1940, R10. 9 through 12. Early US cork grips, 1918 through 1937. Starbucks, R10. 13. Elton, list as the Sure Grip Ventilator Pick, but called the Sink Drain Grip by collectors. 1953. Measle, Cat, R8. 14. Vacuum Grip, patent 1911 by J. Gaynor through 1930s, R8. Also comes in standard 351 and rounded tri-346 shapes, R10. 15. Wire Loop Grip, patent 1918, A. Birdwise, R8. 16. Heart Hole Grip, Germany 1910, Meinl and Harold, Cat, R10. 17 through 20. Rubber Plug Grip, patent 1914 by L.C. Nachstedt, available through 1930s. R7, R8, R9 and R9 respectively. 21. Non-skid, raised screen like abrasive. Gretsch 1933, cat or similar no logo brand. R8. 22. Rubber grip moulded to celluloid, not wrapped tape. Most likely German, circa 1930. R10. 23 and 24. Crescent grips. Attached celluloid circular bands. Dandrea, circa 1930. Also made by Germans as well. R9. 25 through 32. Cork grips. All Dandrea except 26, 27 and 32. R7. R10. R7. R7. R10 plus, number 29. R7, R7, and R8, respectively. 33 through 40. Corrugated grips, all with varying mechanical corrugated impressions. Note for 36 below. All R7 or R8. 36. Hand scraped cross hatch genuine tortoise shell, Germany 1936, Edelton cat, and as late as 1958, B&J cat, R8. Note. The original Nachstedt appears with the patent date Pat Nov 10, 1914, impressed around the centre plug for the duration in which it was patent protected. Those thereafter did not have this impression. The cork grips have varying specs in cork size, thickness, inner and outer diameter, and composition, natural or granulated cork, except for 28 and 29, which are the same. Most of these cork grip styles would disappear from catalogues by 1960. The corrugated were produced by various manufacturers dating from the late 1920s, far left, and only number 40 is a confirmed Dandrea. From about 1950 onward, Dandrea used a corrugated press that also embedded its DA logo into the celluloid. From the 1950s through the early 1980s, they were also the largest producer of cork and corrugated grip picks. While their models are less difficult to locate than the others, it's still no easy task. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Heavy Repping. My name is John John Davidson, and what follows is an article entitled An Introduction to Vintage Guitar Picks, written by Joe Macy, published here in part at his request, and in full by Heavy Repping. If you would like any more information on vintage picks, please visit Joe's YouTube channel at the link in the description, or visit heavyrepping.com for the complete text-based article. Part 5 Mosaics and Patterns Producing celluloid in these attractive patterns was as much art as craft, and that knowledge disappeared with the craftsmen who lost their jobs when the US-made Golden Age celluloid came to a close in 1949. The Italians largely supplied the US pick market thereafter, and while they made their own attractive celluloids, they were, of course, in different patterns than had been previously produced in the US. None of the lively colours or patterns these picks display are printed. 
The material itself is made that way. In fact, printing on them would simply interfere with their appearance and detract from the printed logo or message itself. That's why most of these are never printed on. It's like spray painting a message over a piece of artwork. It just doesn't work. But the lack of a logo or grip features that could lead to their identity is further compounded by the fact they don't show up in vintage musical instrument catalogues at all. Yet many can still be identified in terms of country of origin and era. Fewer can be identified by manufacturer, but that too is still possible via a cross-comparison of patterns and distinct shapes. I'm confident 22 of the first 35 in rows 1 through 5 are Golden Age, pre-1950 and all the Golden Age pieces are US-made. Rows 6 and 7 are another matter. They are all French. More details on those to follow. The entire first row shows seven different mosaic patterns. Pick number one is the oldest style mosaic known. Made of of turn-of-the-century, not this century, French celluloid by D'Andrea in the 1930s, it's come to be known as the crayon mosaic. Unlike most translucent mosaics that followed, the colours are solid and crisply separated from one another, rich and more intense. It was produced in well over a dozen shapes and hails as the king of all mosaics commanding the highest prices. A long mandolin pick, dark and dull in appearance, sits next to it circa 1940, much rarer than a crayon mosaic, and featured here because of its elusive background. I suspect it to be a transitional mosaic to the brighter types that would follow in years to come. Numbers 3, a true confetti, and 4, striated, are 1960s Japan. Identifying their origin is simple. A Japan impression appears in very small lettering. All Japanese vintage picks have this impression, and those that don't simply miss the stamp during production. Japanese picks started appearing in US catalogues around 1958, but evidence suggests some types arrived prior to that. Next is a German-made mosaic in a 348-351 hybrid shape. Six is a 1960s D'Andrea shape 359, and lastly at the end of the row, a real bright clown bar variety. Row two through five are all pattern pieces with rarity from seven to ten. The most peculiar is number 20, a laminate believed to be, and by all appearances, a woman's nylon stocking sandwiched between a bottom white layer and a lacquered top circa 1940. The last two rows are all French in origin. Ten of the 14 are laminates. They are called the Juras because that's the geographical location they originated from in France. The factory that produced them, or company that distributed and sold them, is unknown at this time. Compare them with the mostly US pieces in the first five rows, the differences are distinct and obvious. Those such as 41, 42 and 46 give the impression of some form of modern art, and 43 looks like part of an actual painting. Picks 38, 39 and 44 are shapes only seen with the Juras. Not shown are two more shapes exclusive to the Jura group. Their dates range from the 1930s for the non-laminate flat picks like 36 and 38, to anywhere after World War II for the rest. The flat picks are most likely made from a German celluloid rubber hybrid material as confirmed by a burn test. Prior to that test, it was believed that only pure celluloid could be made to be that attractive, but the Germans were the sole masters at producing rubber picks, and both rubber and celluloid were manufactured in the same factories. While number 44 has the nylon stocking appearance of the American number 40, it does not have the lacquered surface, the red flower number 47 does have a lacquered surface, however. All range from 8 to 10 plus in rarity. Though not shown here, several dozen more Jura colour patterns exist. The crafters who made them were obviously inspired to stay in the creative process in order to produce such a large variety of patterns and invent five new shapes. Noticeably missing from their inventory is shape 351, not a single Jura appears in America's most marketable pick shape that would eventually be adopted across Western Europe. That reason alone lends to their authenticity across the board as vintage pieces that possibly precede the 1960s, but until further information surfaces as confirmation, their place in history will remain speculative. Part 6. Fender and Gibson These are the oldest printed logos of Fender and Gibson picks. Part 6a, Fender. 
Of the five fenders, picks number one, standard 351 shape, and number five, jazz shape 358.5, were the first logos used by Fender, and the only two shapes available when Fender started printing their name on picks around 1955. Just as with the spaghetti logo on the headstock of 1950s Fender guitars, pick collectors also call the first Fender logo, far left, by the same name, but they are obviously different in appearance. The small jazz pick is termed the Fender F pick. The spaghetti logo continued to be featured in Fender pick advertisements until at least 1964, at which point, like the headstock logo on Fender guitars, it was changed to match, accurately this time, the headstock logo as it appeared on their guitars and is known as the Perrin design after the designer himself. Vintage guitar collectors certainly want to match a 1950s Fender pick with their 1950s Fender guitar. This can still be done with spaghetti logo picks, because several celluloid styles specific to the 1950s were used by Fender. The jazz pick on the far right, featured on an early wheat straw style, is one of them. If you were to find a 351 Fender shape on that celluloid, rest assured it is from the 1950s. There are other distinct 1950s tortoise celluloid styles Fender used not shown here. Noticeably absent from all five Fender picks is the trademark R symbol. While CBS bought Fender in 1965, it was not until 1971 that they received a trademark for the Fender name. It is safe to assume Fender picks missing the trademark were made in the 1960s, but not necessarily pre-CBS. Pick number two is named the backwards F logo by pick collectors. A close look at picks one through three reveals slight variations of the 351 shape in all three. Also called the Ernie Ball shape because so many early EB picks are found in that shape, D'Andrea was the only known producer of Fender picks from the start of their logo and for decades thereafter. That particular shape coincidentally just happened to be adopted by Ernie Ball, who in its early years had other companies produce his company's strings and picks. The most intriguing Fender is certainly the middle pick, with the second generation F-style. Excruciatingly rare, and certainly a short-run promo likely intended for a 1960s Chicago NAM show. The logo for pick number 6 on the far right was produced from the 1960s through the 1980s by the millions in a variety of colours and shapes, yet trying to find them today requires some searching. Like combs, they just seem to disappear. Part 6b. Gibson. Four of the five Gibson logos are different. Only two and five are the same, but a different colour. The Arch logo was a favourite, extending decades back into the pre-print era of Gibson picks, but does not match any Gibson headstock I am aware of. Pick number three, also an Arch logo but in the largest font size ever recorded on any of their picks. Picks number one and number four do match headstocks Gibson has used, and the Splash logo seen in number four dates to 1960. It continued to be used through the 1980s on their black picks. Identifying 1960s versions of the Splash logo are easy, because they are on less common shapes, such as shape number 360 in this case, and featured in tortoise, not black. As with Fender, this is just a small sample of Gibson vintage picks produced post-1950 through the 60s. Picks numbers 2 through 5 are definitely D'Andrea made, and looking closely above the Blue Arch logo, you can see the DA logo in cursive as part of the corrugated impression. It's just above the letter O. While this era marks the beginning for picks bearing Fender's name, Gibson picks extend back another 40 years into the pre-print Golden Age era. Just as a matter of reference, the most diverse and colourful Fender picks were made during the 1990s and could be the subject of an entire article alone. Gibson's Golden Age Gibson Golden Age picks go back to at least 1914. Here are three all in different shapes and tortoise patterns. The long mandolin pick on the left is their first pick logo, the Gibson. The other two are both circa 1935, but appear earlier and later respectively, as the differences between the text here and the photo ages suggest. Unlike guitars, picks have a wider latitude in terms of their dates of production. There are dozens of Golden Age Impress logo models, made in a variety of tortoise patterns as well as ivoroid, white and black. D'Andrea produced many of them after 1922. 
Prior to and concurrent with Dandrea was another company, most likely a Chicago-based manufacturer as yet to be identified, who made picks for them as well. The big mandolin pick on the right was dated by comparison to a 1935 SS Stewart guitar pickguard. Part 7. Impressed Logo Era and Conclusion Photo A. Cristofaro Oldest verifiable pick known to exist. After Cristofaro left Italy and travelled Europe entertaining audiences with his brilliant mandolin playing. He settled down in Paris and set up shop as a teacher. In 1881 he released his first instruction manual for mandolin. It contained an illustration of a pick having the same shape as the one shown here. His second manual was published in 1883. By 1890 he was dead. As a mandolin instructor, it would have been a priority to ensure his students had the correct mandolin pick, and fortunately he left little guesswork as to its origin. The word l'incassable translates from French to English as indestructible. The material is celluloid. This is one of only two Cristofaros known to exist. Photo B. The shapes here are specific to their respective instruments as advertised in old catalogues. There were a variety of shapes of the no logo variety advertised as banjo picks during the 1920s, but banjo picks appearing with an artist or brand name were always short ovals and stout, mandolin picks oval as well, but elongated. The two on the right, of course, are standard 351 shaped guitar pick shapes as we know them. The names on those picks, while largely unknown and forgotten today, were all top level musicians in their time. Among collectors, Picks bearing their name are held in the same or greater esteem as impressed Gibson picks. As one collector put it, they are the Jimi Hendrixes of their time. Those curious to investigate further will find their full names listed as Frank Bradbury, M. J. Schiedelmeyer, Gene Autry, George Barnes, Herbert Forrest Odell and Samuel Siegel. Photo C. Vibratone. Brand name exclusive to St. Louis Music Co., a large Midwest distributor established in 1922. Mandolin pick on wide-banded tortoise celluloid. Radio star. A mandolin pick impressed on 1930s Army Brown celluloid, a type used exclusively by Dandrea. Advertised in 16 models. Why a radio star? Because that was the pinnacle in entertainment achievement in the 1920s and 30s. There were no TV stars. Doro. A brand name of Bugle Eisen and Jacobson, a New York musical instrument distributor. Among the instruments they distributed were the Salvadore de Doro violins. So here we have a banjo guitar pick named in honour of a violin maker. Will Clar. Musical instrument wholesaler established in 1925. Unknown city. Their bread and butter was instruments. Most likely this pick was produced to herald their arrival in 1926, as is the case with many startups. Red Arrow Advertised in 24 models. Mandolin pick on wide-banded tortoise celluloid style. Distributed by Mills Music of NYC. Irving Mills owned a publishing company and recording studio in NYC that Eddie Lang was part of. He promoted the careers of many famous musicians, including Benny Goodman. Among the other picks he sold, Radio Star. The historical significance and interconnectedness of so many in the music business becomes clear when you consider Mills Music, Eddie Lang and Andrea Pick Company were all in NYC at the time. Photo D. Lang and Razor. Eddie Lang, 1902-1933, a top jazz player in his day, endorsed Gibson and played an L4 and an L5. Joe Pass considered him one of three great jazz guitar innovators. Henry Reiser, 1896-1965, a well-respected banjo player who backed other artists such as Bing Crosby and Peggy Lee, penned books on guitar, ukulele and banjo playing. Both artists are found in Gibson catalogues from the 1930s, intermingled among Gibson picks. Photo E. All three represent large musical instrument wholesalers and publishers. The oldest is the Ditson of Boston, Massachusetts, circa 1893, 
verified via a celluloid pickguard on an 1893 Howard mandolin. The B&J mandolin pick, circa 1925. Like the Cristofaro, it advertises the city of origin right on the pick. Currently the only two impressed picks I am aware of to do so. Lastly at the top is a Bruno on early tiger-striped celluloid impressed on a trapezoid shape, circa 1940. The US had abandoned use of this shape in the late 1940s, but it was picked up and copied by the Japanese and saw commercial use again starting in the 1950s, namely by Herco as part of their cabinet assortment of 15 different shapes. Photo F omitted from article. Photo G. Mayflower circa 1920, and not the sterile commercial representation as the word Mayflower. The former was used by Harry J. Flower in honour of his daughter May for the mandolins he sold around 1900. Later both Lyon and Healy and Wurlitzer would lay claim to the name for use as a mandolin brand. You may note the M and F are both capitalised and slightly separated denoting a proper name. The Warner pick is lacking catalogue proof of origin, but there was a luthier in the 1920s by the name of James Luck Warner who is the best guess for now. Photo H. Rarely seen the Martin and Gretsch impressed logos. An earlier version of Martin appears with the CF Martin logo. There are no known versions of an earlier Gretsch. Photo I. The middle white US mandolin pick shows the round Wurlitzer trademarked logo. Howard was the oldest son of owner Rudolph and succeeded him as president. The 1915 Wurlitzer catalogue advertises the Howard Mandolin pick as number 2472. Though not apparent in the photo, the printing is in amazing detail, sharp and clear. The smallest semi-curved font below Howard reads, The W and H Co. Newark NJ. If that is the identity of the company who made the pick for Wurlitzer, they weren't sharing their print technology with anyone else in the pick business, as 35 years would pass before printing on picks would become popular. The boson and atlas on either end of the photo were styles that the Germans co-opted. But why not? The French stand as the first great innovators of picks at the turn of the 20th century. The fact that they successfully used gold print on a pick 20 years ahead of the US is no surprise. Photo J. In and of themselves, one would be hard pressed to identify these as guitar picks, save for the fact images appear on the actual patents. A wire pick was eventually patented in the US over 60 years later. This metal English pick was known to me for over 10 years after having completed patent searches with the USTPO and European Patent Office in 1999. I was amazed to find this one among other picks in a group of picks online. The middle three blade pick closes into one or splays out into three. The Germans also made the same style pre World War II. The two tiered Caron on the right was produced in a quantity of 10,000 and distributed out of Orange County, California by Rickenbacker, as inventor Conrad Caron, deceased, explained to me in an interview. It separates in half and can be adapted to hold multiple tips. This adaptation was not marketed, however, and he kept it among his other pre-patent prototypes. Conclusion Considering the picks shown for this article represent less than 3% of the collection they were drawn from, you get an idea of just how many different kinds of vintage picks there are. Previously unknown vintage models keep surfacing every year both in catalogues and as real examples. Details of the picks shown here are far more expansive than space would allow for this article, and for those newly exposed to this hidden world, just looking at them for now is sufficient for apperception. I had done just that for my first five years as a collector. Once I began investigating their history though, I became equally fascinated by their background place in time and history and relation to one another. While a vintage guitar collector's first priority may be to match a correct period pick with their vintage guitar, having a Jura, unusual vintage grip or any other vintage pick for that matter as a complement to the name brand piece would certainly stand out in an accessories compartment of a case once displayed. 
Some guitar collectors have already started collecting vintage picks as their interest peaked after being exposed to the previously unknown world of something once considered meaningless beyond its function to pluck a string.